can be seated. <coughs> See, Alex mentioned earlier, uh, if you don't already know me, my name is Adam Wilson. I'm the usually the worship minister here, uh, so I'm usually standing there singing and stuff, and uh, just very, very thankful, first of all, um, just to give the opportunity to preach. It's been, it's been a while. Uh, that's for my own choice, um, but uh, so I'm glad to be doing it again, and I'm very appreciative of Peyton and the worship team uh, for filling in. Uh, they do a great job. Um, so, and plus, it gives me a chance to play drums, which I enjoy. So, um, but hey, uh, if you're just joining us this morning, we're in the middle of a series that we call View from the Top. We're looking at a section of the Gospels in the Bible. Uh, it's called Sermon on the Mount. And the reason it's called that is because Jesus climbed up on a mountain and gave a sermon. Rocket science. So, we call this series View from the Top not because Jesus must have had a nice view up there. I'm sure it was. We call this series View from the Top because as Jesus was on this mountaintop preaching this sermon, he was painting a picture. He was painting a picture, a perspective, a view of what the Christian life is supposed to look like, of what your daily life, what your relationships, your every choice that you make, what it's supposed to look like if you follow Christ. And you see, people in that day had developed a, a distorted view, uh, to say the least, of what they thought it was supposed to mean to be God's people. People in that day had developed this view of God's heart that was not right. It was wrong. And so the same thing is true today that was true then, which is... If you have an incorrect view of God's heart, if you have a misunderstanding of who God is, it will affect everything you do. It will affect every relationship you have. The people in that day had developed an understanding of things, their culture that said, you know, their culture said these things are right and good, and Jesus was getting up and saying, no, no, they're not right and good. They're actually destroying people, and they're separating people, and they're building walls. They're tearing people down. And so Jesus wanted to get up on a high place and say, hey, look, that's not right. If you look at things through God's eyes, if you have God's perspective on life, then you'll be doing things that will actually build people up and will actually create stronger relationships. So today we're going to see what Jesus had to say about generosity. Now, first of all... Um, if you know anything about church, but you don't go to church very often, you're thinking, oh, great, there's going to be a sermon on giving. Uh, and that's not, it's not what you think. Uh, okay, so let's just go ahead and get that out of there before you think, oh, man, I showed up to a church and they're going to tell me that I need to give them their money. No, that's, that's not what we're doing here today, okay? We're just going to talk about what God's heart is for generosity. So first of all, let me tell you a story about a man named James Robertson. In 2015, the the excuse me, the Detroit Free Press, I'll get it out, uh, had an article telling the story of James's commute to and from work. The article explained that 56-year-old James would walk 21 miles around trip to get to work, and he had been making this commute for 10 years since his car broke down. He made a good wage, but not good enough to buy and insure a car in Detroit. He worked the 2 to 10 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift at his factory. He left his house at 8 a.m. to start work at 2 p.m. And then he would get back home at 4 a.m. So if you're doing the math, he'd get about a couple hours of sleep before he'd have to get back up and go do it all over again. Through all of this, James Robertson had a perfect attendance record. I've never been to Detroit. I've heard about what the winters must be like up there. I've heard that they're pretty nasty, and, and yet that didn't slow James down. He still had a perfect attendance record with that kind of travel to work. And the owners of that factory actually set their attendance record, their standard, by him. They said if he can get here, anybody can get here. Now, this had been going on for 10 years, and so I read this and I'm thinking, how was this going on for 10 years and nobody stepped in? Like, nobody did anything to help this guy out. Well, see, he had a bus ride for part of the, the, of the journey to get to and from work, but it was only part of it. Buses didn't go where else he wanted to go. And then nobody else that he worked with lived anywhere near him. So they would have to go out of their way. And still I'm thinking, man, 
how did this go on for 10 years? Well, I can't speak for his coworkers, but I can say that I've been in a situation where I've seen somebody in need and I can come up with all kinds of excuses why I shouldn't help. You know, maybe I would have looked at him and I'd said, well, you know what, he's a hard worker. He'll get his stuff figured out eventually. He'll, he'll get all that figured out. He doesn't need my help. Or somebody else here is surely more equipped than I am to step up and help. I don't really know the guy. You know, if I'm going to have to ride in the car for a long time with this guy, and have, it's going to be a long ride for an awkward conversation in a car. Nobody wants that. You know, I don't really have time to help, like, permanently. I could help once or twice, but if I can't really solve the problem, I'm really just a hindrance, right? You know, I mean, if, if I'm only going to help once or twice, it's, it's kind of almost making it worse. Or maybe I would just look at him and I would say, you know what, he probably did something to deserve whatever the situation he's in right now. And so I would say, well, since he probably did something to deserve it, I'm just going to let him sit in it. These are the kind of things that I know I've thought of. I don't know about you guys, but I know I've thought of that kind of thing whenever I see somebody in need. After the article came out about James, a flood of responses hit the Detroit Free Press. Over the next three days, calls and emails flooded from people that wanted to give him cars, money, rides to work, jobs. Some people just wanted to give him a hug. There were so many people wanting to help James, but they weren't sure how until a 19-year-old college student at Wayne State University stepped up. As a computer science major, Evan Leedy just saw what was going on. He read this article, he saw how many people were wanting to help, and he said, well, he needs a GoFundMe account. So he got on GoFundMe, created an account for James, and within hours, this account had raised $30,000. Within a week, this account had raised $360,000, and Ford had donated a new Taurus. But the story doesn't end with money in a car. You see, a bunch of big league financial advisors understood that this kind of a change in James's life was going to be big and it was going to be hard to get used to and that kind of a change you might you know make some bad choices and so some big league financial advisors donated their time to say hey James let us help you understand how to deal with this you know this new windfall you've got this uh, these new riches that you've got in your life and how to how to do it wisely and not only that, but the city of Detroit actually looked at the public transportation system after this article and all this flood of response and everything, and they started really working on trying to fix the public transportation system and for people just like James who were having issues getting to work and things like that. So I can sum up what we're going to talk about today with one sentence. And that sentence is, true generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. You see, we, when we think about generosity, a lot of times we think about it in terms of one-time events, okay? So, like, I decide I'm going to be generous, and so I'm going to go look for an opportunity, I'm going to go find something, and when, once I've given to that, or done whatever it is, donated my time, money, resources, whatever it is, they feel better, I feel better, we're good, moving on. One-time event. Or I'm, you know, walking down the street, see somebody that's in need, I feel enough to actually reach in my pocket, give out, give it to them, they feel better, I feel better, we're done, good. One-time event. True generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. And I believe that's what Jesus was trying to say in the main passage that we're going to be looking at today in Matthew chapter 6. So let's read it together. If you have a Bible with you this morning or a Bible app, I encourage you to go there. If not, it'll be on the screen. This is the New Living Translation. Jesus says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. You see, the, what he's talking about, these, uh, the hypocrites blowing trumpets and stuff in the synagogues and the streets, this is what the Pharisees would do. They would, they would walk down the street and you know, people were constantly asking for money or whatever, and then they would, they would blow trumpets and stuff as they were walking down the street, and then they would give, and everybody would say, oh, isn't that wonderful, isn't that great? And that became the motivation behind the Pharisees' generosity. And so notice that Jesus first of all notice that he does not say we should give to those in need he just says when you do 
So right off, Jesus is starting out not by saying you should be giving to those in need. He's saying, look, for Christians, generosity is a given. Okay, so I said that first service, and everybody sat looking at me about like that. I'm going to say it again. Generosity is a given. Does anybody see the humor in that? Like, but don't, shh, no, no? Okay, fine. Whatever. Yeah, no, it's a tough crowd. Anyway, so, the, uh, but no, so Jesus is saying, look, the Pharisees have, think that the purpose behind generosity, the purpose is a one-time event. I go out, I give, I get some applause. Oh, how nice. Isn't that nice? But that's not the purpose. The, the purpose tr of true generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. So, we're going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a question this morning. It might seem kind of odd, but the question is, where does generosity come from? And I think that's the first question that we need to tackle today. Where does generosity come from? Well, that answer, the answer to that question has two parts. Number one, generosity is at God's very core of who He is. I'll say it another way. God is a giver. This was evident in the very beginning when God created everything and then created Adam in his own image and told Adam, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. Well, just when Adam, the first man, saw this and he's like, Man, can this gift ever be topped? Then God created Woman. God is a giver. Amen? Come on. Really? Yeah, the guys are asleep this morning. All right, James 1.17. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. And then the verse that everyone knows, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Gave. That's right. This is at the core of who God is. So if we're asking where, gener where does generosity come from, number one, generosity is at God's very core. Number two, generosity is a response. Specifically, our generosity is a response. Okay? When I'm leading worship or when I'm talking about worship or whatever, a lot of times I will use the word response because worship... Uh, Warren Wearsby tells the definition of worship and, and is basically a response to God for who He is and what He has done. And so, if you think about that, that doesn't just apply to singing in here, right? That applies to every single thought, action, word, whatever you do all day long. If you're actually responding to who God is and what He's done for you, that should filter down into everything you do, right? So that's what worship is. That's why we talk about worship as a lifestyle and not just a time we come in here for a few minutes and sing, okay? Now, this is spelled out all through the Bible. The Apostle John said it in 1 John 4, 19. We love each other because He loved us first. It's a pattern for us to follow. God loves us, we love others. God is generous with us, we are generous with others. In Genesis 12, God's people, the Jews, didn't even exist yet. But God was about to start it all through one man. Maybe you've heard the song, Father Abraham has many sons. Well, Abraham was born the name Abram. And in Genesis 12 is when God first talks to Abram. He says... Uh, it says in Genesis 12, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Abram is told twice that God is going to bless him so that he will be a blessing to others. God's design for humanity is built around generosity. God's generosity to his children, his children's generosity to others. That's God's design. Now that we've answered the question, where does generosity come from? The next question we're going to ask is, what's the purpose of generosity? What's, why generosity? Now, if you've ever experienced bringing a baby home for the first time, you'll know that there are at least a thousand and one things that must be assembled before the baby gets there. Naturally, I waited, and I had to assemble at least 102 of them in one night. Now, I read the instructions. I promise, I read the instructions, okay? But I kid you not, every time that I was trying to assemble something, there was always some part that I'm looking at the instructions, and I'm yelling quietly because the baby's asleep. I'm yelling, what is the purpose of this? 
it wasn't clear to me. Like there would be parts left over that literally I could not find in the instruction manual. I'm picturing some guy in a factory somewhere is just like throwing extra parts in a box. Yeah, whatever, you know, see what they do with this. You know, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's so frustrating to me when the purpose of something, it's there, it's surely it's supposed to be going, it's, it's got a purpose, right? And so when the purpose is not clear, it can be very frustrating. It's very important for a purpose to be clear. So if we're gonna talk about generosity, let's talk about its purpose, right? Looking back at our main passage for today, the Pharisees misunderstood the purpose of generosity and Jesus wanted to make sure that his followers did not have that same misunderstanding of the purpose of generosity. So let's look at verses 1 and 4 again. Verse 1, and watch out. Don't do your deeds publicly to be, to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 4, give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Pharisees thought generosity was about a one-time event. Give a little bit of money, get a lot of praise. They thought that's all it was about. They had convinced themselves that this is all generosity is about. I give a little bit of money, I get a lot of praise, we're good. But Jesus is saying that true generosity looks completely different. All right. Now, don't misunderstand these verses. Don't, don't read this and think that, generous is, or that Jesus is saying, be generous for the purpose of getting a reward. That's not what Jesus means here. Okay? What he's saying is, we already have a reward. That's done. If you follow Christ, the reward is done. You don't earn it. You can't earn it. It's there. It's already there. So... We respond to that fact. We respond to the promise of the waiting reward. We just respond by giving, okay? Because the reward's already done. So we're not giving for the purpose of a reward. Instead of being like the Pharisees and pretending to be generous just to get a reward like praise from a few people, our generosity should come from gratitude. Because the reward that we have waiting for us is better than anything on this earth. And we didn't have to do anything to earn it. Jesus is saying instead of give to get, we give because we already got. Sorry for the bad grammar. I just had to do it. So, we know the purpose of generosity is not to receive applause from people. But what is the purpose of generosity? I believe it's this. So people can see God. I believe that is the purpose for Christians to be generous. Is so people can see God. Genesis tells us that we are made in God's image. And as we saw earlier, generosity is at the core of, very, uh, of God's heart of who He is. I once heard it say that God made us in His image because we are the only image of God some people will see. When you walk in our main entrance, there's a sign right in front of you with a mission statement on it. It's to become like Jesus and share Him intentionally in local, national, and global neighborhoods. If the first part of that is to become like Jesus, well, it should be pretty clear that generosity would be part of that as we're trying to become like Jesus. Jesus explained His purpose this way, in Matthew 28, this is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. You see, the world tells us that our purpose, our mission on earth is to be consumers, is to just consume as much as you possibly can and then die happy. But the reality is, we as Christians are following a leader who was never a consumer, he was never a taker. He was always a giver. The reality that we need to grasp today is that Jesus is generous, but the only way some people will find that out is through our generosity. Generosity in small things can open doors to bigger things. True generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. A follower of Jesus who shows true generosity will open doors for Jesus to walk through and change someone's life. 1 John 3, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed His life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we are living truly, living in God's reality. I was researching for the sermon. There were a few verses that had already popped in my mind as soon as I saw what the topic was. And the first verse that popped in my mind was Luke chapter 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
All right, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've read this verse, you've heard this verse, you've heard it preached on, talked about, seen it on coffee mugs, all that kind of stuff. And we all probably have our own context, our own ideas that kind of go along with what this verse means to us. Well, this, this is a very short verse, but it has a lot of truth that I think we can easily gloss over. And I think first we need to break down the word treasure because we might look at that first thing we think is money, you know, whatever, but I think it might be better to say valuables. And what I mean by that is not just jewelry, but I mean valuables. What do you work to get and what do you work to protect? Okay, you work hard to get money to buy things. You work hard to get money to keep the things you already have. That's just kind of what we do, right? And so if you think about that and you say, okay, if that picture is what treasure means, then now we're getting an idea of what this verse is talking about. Now, see, this looks different for all of us because we all spend our money on different things. We all work to get different things. We all work to protect different things. But my guess is that if we all were to start comparing our receipts and our bank statements, things are going to rise to the top like mortgage and groceries and bills and utilities and entertainment and things like that. There's nothing wrong with these things. The Bible tells us over and over again that God created these things for us to enjoy. Okay? But here's the thing. If those things are what we treasure, then our hearts are in the wrong location. Okay, understand that here. The verse is saying where your treasure is, there your heart is. It's talking about a location. It's talking about an actual physical location of your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. In Luke chapter 12, where this verse is found, Jesus tells a parable about a man who is so rich that he has to build more barns for all of his stuff. And he's very proud of the fact that he has to build more barns for all of his stuff. And then Jesus ends the parable by asking the question, okay, so what happens to all that stuff when you die? You see, you realize his treasure was in those barns and then the new barns, right? He put his treasure there, which means his heart was there. Which means before he even died, his heart was already sold to the highest bidder. That's what Jesus is trying to say here. What does this have to do with generosity? The point is this. Generosity reveals the location of your heart. Right? There's a reason that the Bible says we should give our tithe to God right off the top through the local church. First thing, because if you do that, you're saying that your treasure lies with the one who gave it to you. And if your treasure is there, then your treasure is not locked away. It's free to be used by God. So the question today is, is your heart locked up in bills or benevolence? I'm not saying don't pay your bills because the Bible's pretty clear that you need to pay what you've agreed to pay. You need to pay your debts. But maybe you're sitting there and you're picturing your, your budget and you're like, Man, my heart must be really locked up because I don't have a single penny for generosity. I mean, I, I barely live week to week. Every penny that comes in goes right back out before it even comes in, right? First of all, I have to say you're not alone. I get it. Uh, and I guarantee you almost everybody in this room has been there at least once in their life. And if that's where you are right now, I want you to know that God does not want you to stay there. That's not God's plan for you, is not to live like that. that. That's not what He wants for you. And if you would be open to somebody helping with your finances, helping you get that figured out, helping you get out of that prison, then come see us. We'd love to, to hook you up with somebody who can help in that area. But maybe all it takes is just praying to God a, a simple prayer and saying, help me be generous. Because I can promise you this, God loves generosity so much, He will do it. If you ask God to help you be generous, He will help. He will create opportunities. He will give you what you need to fulfill those opportunities. And then He will bless you so that you can do it again. One thing that has to be pointed out is that we do have an enemy that wants to stop our generosity. And his favorite argument is you can't afford it. All right, maybe some of you have heard this story before. If you knew my mom at all, you probably heard this story about four times. When I was in high school, my mom found herself divorced for a second time and left with bills that completely outweighed her income. Just 
completely. And I remember us having lots of yard sales just so that we had money for groceries. Um, now, I was a teenager, right? So I didn't fully understand how bad our finances were. Um, but one of the things that she would talk about whenever she would tell the story about this time of our lives is that this happened multiple times. She would come to me and she would say, okay, here's the deal. We have 20 bucks left to live on for a week, uh, but church is tomorrow and we don't have anything to put in the offering plate. And she would ask me, a teenager, what do you think we should do? Apparently, I always answered, put in the offering plate. Like, it was nothing for me to say that. Now, I don't know that I'd feel that way today, like, you know, in that kind of situation, but as a kid, you know, I, I had heard in church what we're supposed to do. She's coming to me. She's kind of presenting this, and I felt like that's what she was asking. She wanted me to say, right? And so I was like, put it in the offering plate, right? But then, when mom would do that, when she would do that, she would go ahead and put the money in the offering plate and then say, I don't know what's going to happen after this point, but I'm just going to have to trust God for it. He always would, every time. There were multiple times that an envelope would show up in our mailbox, had nothing written on it, $700 cash inside. And it was, we never know who did it, we just assumed it was somebody in our church. We, we used to like to speculate on who it might be, um, but the bottom line is that person was doing exactly what Jesus said, giving in private, you know, not letting your right hand see what your left hand is doing, that kind of thing. So that happened multiple times, would just show up with cash, and it was always $700. Um, so then, <laughs> her favorite thing that she used to like to talk about this time of our lives was when people would try to sell her things, okay? So she's divorced for a second time, single mother, overwhelmed with bills, bankrupt, all this kind of stuff, and she would get telemarketers to call and try to sell her things, right? And so she would let them go through her whole, their whole spiel, and then she would start and tell her spiel, and then laugh as they tried to quickly get off the phone. So her favorite time, and I remember this vividly, I really do, I remember this vividly, this guy pulled in our driveway, <coughs> in a refrigeration truck. It was like a little beat-up pickup truck and a refrigerator built into the bed. It comes up and he's like, uh, he's selling frozen meat, okay? So it's all a big side of beef, basically. So he's coming up and he's selling this beef and he's sitting at the front door and he says his whole spiel or whatever and then mom tells her part, you know, whatever. Well, he's not taking no for an answer. And so he's just like, come on, I really don't, I don't have room for this meat at home. I don't have any place to put this. This is the last batch or whatever. I just need to get rid of it, whatever. So mom starts getting frustrated, right? So because this guy's not taking no for an answer. Well, finally she gets so frustrated. She says, look, the only thing in this house that's worth anything is two gold wedding bands that aren't being used anymore. And he said, I'll take it. So he took that. We got a whole side of beef. We ate like royalty for a year. I mean, you know, we didn't have money to go to the grocery, but we had T-bones and ribeyes and filet mignon. I'm telling you, God provides. Mom always remembered that. She always liked to tell people that, that every time that she gave whatever she could to God, he returned the favor much more than whatever it was that she gave. Generosity is less about what's in your bank account than what's in your heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Every time you're generous with even the smallest thing, you're telling God that you're open to being used by Him, and He will honor that. Proverbs 19, If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and He will repay you. Proverbs 11, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Understand this. This is not the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is a gross misunderstanding of Scripture. That is not what's being said here. But we cannot ignore the fact that Jesus says, all through the Bible, if you're generous, you will be rewarded. Okay? Here's the difference between the truth and the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel says we do these things because God wants to make us rich. The truth is, the truth of Scripture is, we do these things knowing that we will be blessed for the purpose of doing it again. Don't miss this. The whole reason we're blessed is to bless others. So if we do something and God rewards us, what do you think He wants you to do with that? Do it again and do it bigger. That's the purpose. God's design and His desire is to use people to reach people. He loves to do that. 
He loves to reach people using people to do it. And generosity is his favorite way to do it. He wants to use us to bless others, and the more we let God do that, the more he will bless us so that we can do it again. It's not give to get blessed and then live fat and happy. It's give, get blessed, give bigger. True generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. I challenge you to find any truly generous person who regrets being generous. Find anybody who is actually a generous person and see if they'll tell you that generosity ruined their marriage, their lives, their children, their finances. As always, science backs what God has already said. A medical journal called Nature Communications published a study of the effects of generosity on the brain. The experiment looked like this. They told, they told 50 people at the beginning of the experiment that they were going to be receiving $100 over the next few weeks. They told half of them to spend it on themselves. They had to spend it on themselves. They told the other half they had to spend it on someone else. And then they measured brain activity using MRI and all that kind of stuff during, you know, interviews and whatnot. So while being monitored by an MRI, those who agreed to spend the money on someone else showed more interaction between the parts of the brain associated with altruism and happiness. And those people even reported higher levels of happiness at the end of the experiment. Time magazine wrote an article where they interviewed one of the guys, one of the researchers involved in this project. And the guy said, at least in our study, the amount spent did not matter. It was worth keeping in mind that even little things have a beneficial effect, like bringing coffee to one's office mates in the morning. And the article goes on to say, studies have shown that older people who are generous tend to have better health, says Tobler. And other research has indicated that spending money on others can be as effective as lowering blood pressure as medication or exercise. I know which one I'd rather do. Moreover, there is a positive association between helping others and life expectancy, he adds, perhaps because helping others reduces stress. I can tell you from personal experience that KHCC is a generous church. This Sunday today marks 11 years that Vanessa and I have called this church family home. And you guys have opened yourselves up in ways that God has worked through you to bless us, to be generous to us, we have been the recipient of this church's generosity in amazing ways, and we have seen you guys be generous in the lives of so many people. I mean, I'll never forget the first time that we did the Christmas outreach to South Park Tap School, and you guys overwhelmed that entire school with generosity. The students, the faculty, the staff, they were overwhelmed with the amount of generosity you guys were showing. I want everybody in our neighborhood to experience that. I want everybody in this neighborhood to experience the generosity of this church. From time to time, we offer opportunities to show generosity to those that need it. The reason I'm preaching today is because our senior minister, Randy Beard, is with 10 other people in Dominican Republic showing generosity, ministering to kids, telling families that God loves you. Every Sunday this month, we'll be collecting clothes to give to Master Provisions who will then send those clothes around the world. In all of these things, we're reflecting God's heart. We're being God's image to people that need to see it. Early on in this big picture process, we studied the demographics of our neighborhood. And part of that study uh, referred to something called areas of brokenness. The details of that report, they were eye-opening, but they were not surprising because... Every one of us in here has, knows at least one person who has been affected by all of these things. Parenting struggles, single parents, grandparents raising their grandkids, marital problems and divorce, neighborhood safety concerns, financial struggles, health concerns and trouble affording health care, substance abuse and addiction. If we're going to become like Jesus, we have to be focused on our mission. I once heard it said that Jesus' last command is our first priority. His last command is our first priority. Priority. That means our priority, our purpose, our mission is to go and make disciples. Which means we have to get outside of these walls, we have to climb over that hill, and we have to actually go out and find people to be Jesus too, and not wait for them to come here. Okay? That's not the mission. The mission is not to wait for them to come here. Our mission is for us, me included, to get out there and do it. I'm pointing a finger at me. Understand that, please. Art Rayner said, churches are not islands in the community. 
set up to isolate believers from the ails of society. The walls of the church are not protective barriers to community problems. Quite the opposite. The church should be the vehicle by which people are sent into the hardest, darkest parts of the neighborhood. It is not a fallout shelter from a radioactive world. The last point I want to make is this, and it ties it all together. Gratitude and generosity mutually feed each other. If you're struggling with generosity, try gratitude. If you're struggling with gratitude, try generosity. They mutually feed each other. In Titus chapter 3, it says, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. After what we've been given, how can we not be thankful? And after what we've been given, how can we not be generous? If we're truly thankful, we will be. It's just going to happen. That's just what happens if you truly realize what you've been given and you recognize that other people need it too. If you ask God to help you be generous, I promise He will provide. He will answer that prayer because He will put somebody in your path that needs to see God's generosity through you. And He will provide for that opportunity and He will provide for more opportunities beyond that. So if you ask God to help you be generous, you might be thinking of a one-time event, but remember this, true generosity is always bigger than a one-time event. Before I close out, um, I wanted to ask Peyton to come up here. So this church, one of the ways that you guys show generosity is through encouraging kids using their talents. Peyton is one in a long line of kids that have grown up in this church um, that you guys have supported and watched grow and are patient with their mistakes and you're patient with my mistakes and we all thank you for that. Um, so, you know, the thing is, I know I've experienced the generosity of this church. I know Peyton has. La uh, next Sunday is his last regular Sunday with us before he leaves for college. Peyton is one in the long line of kids from this church who have chosen, not chosen, accepted the call of God. They've, he's accepted the fact that God has called him into the ministry, that God wants to do something through him in full-time vocational ministry. And so this morning, as I pray for all of us, as I pray for myself included, to be open to God's leading because God wants to show us doors. He wants to open doors for us to use generosity and then generosity will open doors for Jesus to change lives. It starts with me being open to that. It starts with me looking for opportunities, me ready with resources that God has given me to do that. The same thing goes for Peyton as he gets ready to leave here and he's about to go to Bible college. He needs to be open too. He needs to be open to God's leading. He needs to be open to whatever God wants to do to him and through him, how God wants to train him up. So as I pray, I'm going to be praying for Peyton. I'm going to be praying for us. But I, I do want you guys to give him encouragement uh, today and next week before he leaves. Um, so let's go to God in prayer. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for Peyton. I thank you... Uh, for the whole Baskins family, I mean, they've been uh, just such a such an encouragement to me, Vanessa, and um, and God, I know, I know that you have given Peyton talent that you you don't want him to waste, and he's not. He's not been wasting it, God. He's been using it for your glory. He's been using it to bring people closer to you, God. He's been using it to just shine a light on you instead of him. And so, Father, I pray as he gets ready to leave for college, I pray that you would. You would soften his heart. And then as, as time goes on, the enemy is going to try to convince him that it's all about him. And God, I pray that he would continue to be open to your humility, your love for your people. And so God, I pray for all of us here, myself included, God. I pray, I pray that as we leave here, God, that we would not be dismissed from service. God, we would be sent out into service. That's what we're doing here. And so, God, I pray that you would guide us in this. God, I pray for your help for me to be more generous. God, open my eyes and help me to stop listening to whatever justifications, whatever excuses, whatever lies that the enemy tries to, to convince me of to prevent me from 
reflecting you like a clear mirror to those that need to see you. And so, Father, I thank you for the generosity you've shown in my life. I thank you for the generosity that you've shown in my life through the people in this room. I thank you for the people in this room. I thank you, God, that you have brought us together as a church. God, you brought us together with a mission. You brought us together with a purpose to become like Jesus and share him intentionally. And God, we pray that you would guide us in that, open our hearts to see yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this morning... Uh, usually at this time, Randy stands over here, uh, and uh, I'm going to be behind the drum shield at least till we finish this last song. But once we're done with that, if you want to talk, I'll be, I'll be hanging around as long as you need. Beyond that, if you you know if you don't want to wait around for me, that's fine. We got plenty of guys here that you can talk to. Any of our elders, anybody that has a gold name badge, just please grab somebody before you leave. If you know you know you're having trouble with your finances and you'd really like some help with that, talk to us. We'll try to get you hooked in with somebody who can help with that. If you know this this whole idea of God being generous is new to you and you want to know more about that, come talk to us. We'd be love to share with you about that. If Maybe you've been burned in the past, and maybe you're thinking, yeah, maybe God's been generous with other people, but not with me. Let's talk. Let's pray together. Let's work on that. Let's work through that together. That's, that's what a church family is supposed to be about. So as we get ready to stand and sing, let's just sing about the fact that God is able to do more than we can ever ask or imagine. Let's stand together.